And now it's time for Mob Talk Radio with your host, Chef Canarsi. Yo, Lord willing, Jeff Canarsi, Mob Talk Radio, check it out. Yo, we stay quiet, like Russell Buffalino, when things will get ugly like Pessy's death in Casino. Who do we know? No one, nobody. But we're all well respected like Della Croce and Gotti. I know wild nights, Havana not turn. Light up a cigar and watch your spot burn. You'll get patty whacked, I'm tough like Irish dock workers. Run with guys, with guys, hooligans and black lurkers. Corner berserkers, street savvy soldiers. You owe, you better pay. Don't make me say I told you. Cold you don't betray, I say what I mean. Providence in Brooklyn all the way to the bean. I'd rather be unseen, like Benny the Chin. I don't gotta go to Vegas to see cities of sin. Pull the pin, drop bombs like Danny Green I write homicide like the murder machine Lansky Luciano, mastermind the racket Up in the clam house with a million in my jacket Move around when the streets get darker Pay homage to real bosses like Gambino and Patriarcha Mob talking, but you don't talk to the mob Lord Will and Jeff Canarsi, we stay on our job This is Mob Talk, straight from the streets Mob Talk the life of a beast, Lord Will and Jeff Canarsi, bringing you the rail. Kill all rats, you already know the deal. This is Mob Talk, straight from the streets. Mob Talk, the life of a beast, Lord Will and Jeff Canarsi, bringing you the rail. Kill all rats, you already know the deal. And welcome to Mob Talk Radio. I am your host, Jeff Knarsi. We got a lot to cover this week. Uh, we're going to talk about something at the very beginning, a little news. Uh, and then we're going to get into the Q&A, and we're obviously going to get into Tommy Patera. Probably the first thing I wanted to mention was that Joey Merlino's sentencing date was pushed back about a month and four days. So I believe it's October 17th that Joey's going to get sentenced. And a lot of people have... Uh, have come out and asked me why I think the sentencing date was pushed back. If it has to do any, anything to do with indictments in Jersey, it doesn't, or the sequester of uh, a jury in Pennsylvania it has nothing to do with that. Listen, sometimes things just get changed. Uh, prosecution has other cases. Sometimes they don't flow together. That's the only reason why this was changed. So it's, it's my belief that, you know, October 17th, uh, I think it may be a Thursday. I'm not sure. I'm not looking at a calendar. Uh, but Joey will likely be sentenced that day, uh, probably looking at two years. In reality, uh, do I think uh, gambling is a two-year sentence? No, I don't. But Judge Sullivan has been on record as is really hammering a lot of people. So I think the reality in this certain instance is going to be that Joey's probably going to do like a year and six, year and seven months, uh, and then the rest of that time will get shaved off. Uh, so that's where that goes. Now, there is something I wanted to talk about, and I've talked a little bit about it before, but the first thing I want you to do when you're done listening to this show, go on to Facebook and type in uh, Free Carmine Persico. Uh, I think the actual address is Free Carmine Persico, hashtag the truth or truth, but just go on there and type in Free Carmine Persico, and there's a reason why I want you to go there. Uh, his granddaughter is behind... Uh, trying to get uh, her grandfather out of prison, as well as a friend of his and his attorney. And there's something we need to talk about, and it's the government. And I know before I've sort of come on here and railed against them in a lot of different ways, and, and I could talk about misconduct in case after case after case after case. I mean, if I literally talked about every case that was uh, smelled like shit, looked like shit, tasted like shit, I would probably have a stack from my floor to my ceiling. Uh, but that being said, here's what you need to know. Carmine Persico was convicted in the commission trial. Now, the big sort of uh, pink elephant in the room is that Carmine was basically prosecuted, obviously uh, uh, under RICO laws, and, and obviously he was prosecuted in the commission trial. But the thing is, is that Carmine Persico was not the boss of the Colombo crime family at the time that this happened. Now, the FBI knew about it. Uh, the FBI had documents stating the contrary. They had witnesses that stated the contrary. So if you're going to give somebody, and keep in mind, he wasn't convicted of a single murder in this trial. Uh, those, If he was convicted of multiple murders, then a 100-year sentence sort of makes sense. 
Uh, he ended up getting uh, 20 years per crime convicted of five times. So that's 100 years. And they were consecutive sentences, so not concurrent. So it, does, so it means that he couldn't do 30 and walk out. Uh, however, there's sort of a problem. Uh, when you look at the 302 reports uh, on the informants that came forward with Carmine Persico, uh, they really proved that Persico at the time was not the boss. In fact, many of the crimes he was convicted of took place while he was in prison prior. So the crimes he gets convicted of, he didn't do. Uh, the FBI essentially, and it hasn't been found out till recently, but the FBI buried reports. Now, we've seen this sort of similarly happen with Tony Salerno. Uh, everybody knows that Tony Salerno wasn't the boss. There were actually wiretaps where there was him and an associate talking about guys getting made. And he said, you know what? I've never heard of these fucking people. Let the boss handle it. So there was proof that at the time, Tony Salerno wasn't effectively the boss of the Genovese crime family. And yet he's convicted of being the boss when the FBI knew he wasn't. This is very similar, same sort of bullshit. Uh, I know that his attorney put in a Rule 35 motion, Carmine Persico's attorney, that is, uh, and he asked that Carmine be resentenced because there wasn't a violent uh, predicate. There wasn't a violent act that took place to sort of give him 100 years. I mean, if it, look, Jeffrey Dormer didn't get 100 years. There's a lot of other people that have killed a ton of people that haven't gotten that much time. Uh, and so the rule 35 is really designed to, to ask the judge, take a look at the case based on the merits and then resentence. They absolutely refuse to do that. Um, and Carmine was basically sentenced upon really accusations, uh, of murder, accusations of taking part in this accusations of taking part in that. Uh, and they absolutely weren't proven. Otherwise he would have been convicted of murders. Uh, but even the crimes that he was convicted of, uh, he was in prison at the time that these crimes were committed. So I, I fail to understand why Carmine gets 100 years in prison. Uh, the Court of Appeals and the Supreme Court refused to hear the case. 30-year uh, mandatory, uh, they, they wanted, what the attorneys wanted was a 30-year mandatory parole based on a life sentence. Uh, and more or less, what ended up happening is they denied that as, as well. Uh, but the thing is, is that you have to also look at the time and when Carmine Persico was convicted of crimes. If you go back to the laws back in 19 fucking 80, whatever, uh, technically Carmine should have gotten a 30 year parole. Uh, if that were the case, obviously Carmine would have been paroled at 82 years old. Now he's 85 and in Butner, North Carolina. Uh, the other issue too that goes with this is that when you have information, you have facts that state the government alleges this, the government alleges that here's a 302 that says the opposite. Here's this that says the opposite and that, 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 that sort of, uh, turns it on its tails. Listen, the government's never going to back down. They got what they wanted out of the deal. They're certainly not going to admit malfeasance. They're not going to admit they did something wrong. We've seen this time and time and time and time and time again. And you obviously with today's time period with Donald Trump and, and everything that's going on there, regardless of where your political uh, ideals lie, is that the FBI has been reckless for a very long time. We can go to cases such as Greg Scarpa. Uh, we can go to cases as Whitey Bulger, and it, it, it shows a repeated effort by the FBI, and not just an effort. They actually got away with allowing guys to murder other guys while they were under FBI payroll and protection. Uh, it, it's atrocious. It's happened for a long time now. We saw this in the Joey Merlino case. Uh, they bring forward two rats. These guys aren't believable. They have their own problems, their own crimes. There was no supervision uh, under J.R. Rubio at all whatsoever. Uh, he was allowed to doctor tapes. He was allowed to erase certain parts of tapes. This is misconduct. I'm not in any way because there's going to be a purist and there's going to be a moralist who comes along and says to me, yeah, but these are criminals. They get what's coming to them. Sure. From that perspective, I could totally fucking agree where you're coming from. But the reality is, is that if the government is going to have a blank fucking check and they're going to be able to prosecute five, six, seven, fucking eight times till they get a jury that will convict. There's something a little lopsided than that. 
Uh, this country used to be a country where you were innocent until proven guilty, and we've almost sort of done a 360, and we have become a country that says you're guilty uh, until proven innocent, and that's not right. And listen, yes, of course, I'm going to defend people I care about. I'm going to defend people I know. But most importantly, is Carmine Persico an angel? Absolutely not. Is Carmine Persico a gangster? Absolutely. So I'm not arguing that he hasn't done things in this life that aren't so cool. Uh, he has. But if you're going to sentence somebody, if you're going to convict somebody of something, then it needs to be 100% open and shut fucking case. Uh, when you allow rats to do what they do, when you allow the FBI to sort of give and take and, and turn in what evidence they sort of want to provide, uh, it's absolute bullshit. Uh, I'm a firm believer in that in the Joey Merlino trial, there was an issue where allegedly Joey said something to uh, one of the jurors. Never fucking happened. Uh, this was also designed, I think, in part by the prosecution to sort of stir the pot. I think as well, J.R. Rubio coming off the fucking stand saying that Joey Merlino was having an affair on his wife was another dig from the fucking FBI to try to get at Merlino. Uh, it, it's disgusting. I, I don't understand what, if if the case were that Joey had an extramarital affair or whatever the case may be, which is nonsense, uh, how that provides evidence to murder or to racketeering. I really don't understand. It's a dirty trick that's employed by the government, and that's just sort of kind of how things op operate. Now, the other thing, too, with Carmine, he's very sick. Uh, he's in a wheelchair. From what I understand, he's partially blind at this point. And I also understand that they have made multiple requests for him to see an outside doctor because he has problems with his legs, and there was some concern that he would have to have his legs amputated. Uh, at some point, regardless of who you are, you deserve the right to have a doctor. Everybody knows how prison doctors go. Uh, I don't want to sit here for the next hour and talk about that. Uh, but if you look at the case of John Gotti Sr., uh, throat, neck, and head cancer, uh, won't let him go out to see a, a, a reputable doctor. Now, granted, cancer is one of these things that kills you unequivocally. Cancer doesn't... Uh, Cancer is just one of those things that it doesn't matter who you are, how much money you have, it's going to kill you. That's just the reality. However, I think that the system that's in place, I could talk about John Gotti Jr. and the issue he had with his kidneys and how the, the hacks fucking refused to do anything for him. Uh, yes, when you go to prison, you lose certain rights. But what we don't have the right to do as a society is allow somebody to suffer. First of all, these certain ones of these people aren't going to get out of prison ever the rest of their lives anyway. Uh, but at the same time, I think you have a, a duty and a morality to make sure that they get as much care as they need. Uh, there are going to be those that are going to argue with me on that, saying, well, if they're a multiple murderer, they don't deserve shit. In certain instances, I can agree. Uh, somebody who molests a fucking kid, I, I don't care what their problem is. You shouldn't help them. Uh, but also on the flip side of that, you can't make an argument saying, well, this guy deserves it, but this guy doesn't. So I, I understand that. But in this certain instance, uh, you know, take John Gotti for an example. Now, if, if he goes to a, an oncologist uh, while he's in prison, does that change the reality of what happens to him? Probably not. But he wouldn't drown on his own blood. Uh, and that's just reprehensible. Uh, you look at the water conditions in, in Marion. Uh, they had lead and all kinds of other shit, which could have led to head, neck, and throat cancer. Uh, but those are things that the government wants to bury. And I think that just when you're 85 years old, first of all, you don't have a lot of time left in this world. That's just reality. But at the same time, if you have a condition uh, that... You, you know, you have to spend the rest of your life. You didn't get a death sentence. So why exactly can't these guys see reputable doctors? Uh, it, it's just, I, I don't understand it. I, I think that unless you're served with the death penalty, I, I think that if you have something seriously fucking wrong with you, you should be able to see a, a reputable doctor. They can't do these kind of treatments in prison. Uh, and that's just uh, reality. Uh, also, we have to look at the RICO laws. I, I think the RICO laws need to be changed. I, I think that originally RICO laws were meant to suppress organized crime. I think that was the 
originality of the law. And that's what it was specifically designed for. It was designed really in order for the government to seize assets, check bank records, because if they could tie you with a, a faction or a gang, then they could fucking triple charge everybody and go after everybody. Now, while that law has its merits in certain aspects, in this particular situation, uh, RICO has not only now been used against politicians, but it's been used against political uh, campaigns, and it's also been used against presidential elects. Uh, and I think that the law needs to be revamped. And, and the way that I think that you could do it is I think that the government, and a lot of people are going to disagree with me, but I think that the testimony of informants should not be admissible in a trial as fact. Uh, because let's face it, if I walk in and I'm a fucking informant and we'll just use my buddy Seth Nicoletti, for example, he's a good friend of mine, great actor, great guy. Uh, Brooklyn ties, they're doing something that's going to come out at some point. I don't know the specific, excuse me, specifics about that, but let's say that Seth is on trial and I'm an informant. I'm coming as an informant to tell you my narrative. Okay. If I come in with wiretaps that prove that, okay. If I come in with photos that prove that, okay. If I come in with a handwritten note, okay. But I think that there needs to be a change in the way that the federal government allows informants to step out of the out of the shadows and testify to something that is their opinion. It's not a fact. It's always opinion. The only reason why the government allows these creep show fucking piles of shit to come out of the shadows is because that's the only fucking way they can get a high conviction rate. Uh, and, and that's just the reality of it. Uh, but as far as I'm concerned... It, Rico needs to be changed, I think, and I think that the, the government needs to, you know, think about it this way. What's the incentive when you pay a fucking rat? Well, the incentive is you pay him and he'll tell you what you want to hear. He'll testify. Then he gets all of these wonderful gifts at the end of it, barely does any fucking prison time. And for what? So they can get a high conviction rate. Uh, I think at some point, what they need to do is, like I said earlier, allow, if you're going to allow an informant to testify, I think one, they should not be paid for that because think about it. It becomes a business. If you are, if you're the type of person where you did bad shit and you're going to turn your life around and you're going to get up on a fucking jury box and testify, why do you get the incentive of money and a promise of a, of a sentence reduction? Now they always tell you in court, well, were any deals made to you? Well, no. The only deal that was made was that the government would speak on my behalf for a lesser sentence. How many fucking trials, how many fucking cases have you seen where a fucking rat doesn't get a bail reduction or a sentence reduction? There's only one guy that I know of, and we're going to talk about him today, that did not get a deal. Uh, and, and, and that's the thing. If you're going to, it becomes a business. So I can rat. I can make up stuff and you're going to pay me on top of it. Uh, it's ridiculous. I think that they shouldn't be paid protected. Fine. Do whatever, but they shouldn't be paid for what they're doing. That, that then it becomes, you know, money corrupts everything. And the minute that you bring money into a situation like a trial, you're asking for corruption. You're asking for lies. You're asking for problems. And this is exactly what the FBI has done. They have realized that Think about it. The morality of changing who you are. If I'm involved in five murders and I decide, you know what, I, I a don't want to go to jail. B, uh, you know, I most importantly, I don't want to go to jail and I want to live the rest of my life. Now, there's a difference between a guy who has a morality uh, coming to Jesus fucking type of moment where he says, you know what, I've li lived a bad life. I deserve prison time. I'm going to testify, et cetera, et cetera. Well, if you're if you're truly going to change your fucking life, truly going to change, why the fuck you need money? And that's the glowing thing that I think that bothers me most about informants, other than the fact that they're full of shit and lying, and they're only getting reductions uh, because they're going to say shit about other people that are considered bigger fish in the pond. But I think if you're truly going to be like a, a guy that's going to change his fucking life in all aspects. What the fuck you need money for? What the fuck do you need plastic surgery for? So it's like, 
I, the the second that the government takes out paying these fucking creeps, if that's when that's when it's going to change. And the government's stance on this is going to be, well, if we don't pay these guys, they're not going to do it. So then what does that fucking tell you? That tells you and it proves to you that fucking testimony can be fucking bought. And that's fucking ridiculous. So uh, where it where it sort of stands with Carmine, and I got off on a little tangent there, but where it stands with Carmine is enough is enough is enough. This guy served over 30 years in prison uh, for crimes he didn't do, uh, for having a title he didn't have. The FBI knew that. The, the 302s have been reproduced, reproduced and handed into evidence into the courts. So where's the fucking problem in looking at this? And it goes back to just this idea that they got who they got, they're glad with what they got, and they're moving forward. I I think it's ludicrous, I think it's retarded, and I think that the government owes it to people to get it right. How many times have we seen, and this goes state by state, where a guy gets accused of rape, does 40, 50 fucking years, then they find out, oh, he really didn't do it, DNA proved it wrong. Do they give him a check? Do they apologize? No. And most of these cases, if you look at the West Memphis 3, they didn't do it. It was proven that the West Memphis 3 didn't do it. But the government or the state comes along and says, yeah, we know you didn't do it. Uh, we know that the DNA proves you didn't do it. Uh, but you're still going to have to like accept a guilty plea to get out of prison. That's ridiculous. That's, that's, that's even a more egregious fucking crime. You know these three kids didn't fucking do it. It's been proven in a court of law they didn't do it. They served fucking like 15 or 20 years. You know they didn't do it, but the only way you're going to let them out of prison is if they take a fucking plea to something they didn't fucking do. That is just abhorrent to me. So that's on a small scale. So the idea here is this, in final, before I move on to some questions, is that the reality is, is that I don't believe that their government is 100% honest ever. Uh, I've, I've always been anti-authority. Uh, I've, I've always fought for the underdog in, in any type of situation. But the reality is, is that if you believe everything the government tells you, then I got a bridge in Brooklyn to sell you. It's just not the case. And, and once again, and I'm going to say this. Carmine Persico is 85 years old can't walk he's partially blind what the fuck is he gonna do when he gets out all of a sudden the miracle of jesus is gonna give him the gift of walking and seeing and he's gonna go right back to the fucking mattresses and looking for joey gallo's fucking crypt to blow that up three it's just not gonna happen so what people need to do is you need to start looking at these cases and don't take my word for it look them up for yourself the the just the sheer amount of bullshit and the abuse by the justice department is ludicrous you put a guy in fucking prison for life you allow him no physical contact what what possibly could go wrong with him hugging his kids or him hugging his wife or whoever uh listen prison is designed and built for a certain reason uh there's no fucking such thing as someone going to prison and coming out all for the better uh prison is a fucking crime school times 10 Uh, They use words like rehabilitation and all of this shit and that shit. And and the reality is is that we have way too many people that are in prison for bullshit reasons. We have way too many people in prison. Uh, There are people that that rape children that get three years in fucking prison. And the guy that sells dope, uh, a pound of marijuana, is in prison the rest of his life. There needs to be some sort of uh, look into the way the Justice Department sentences people. Uh and so that that's all I can really say. So go on Facebook and look up Carmine Persico or Free Carmine Persico. Uh, and you will see his granddaughter's site. Uh, sign the petition. Get involved. Help where you can. And listen, I'm not saying Carmine Persico is an angel. Never said that. But what I'm saying is if you're going to get convicted, be convicted of something you actually fucking did. Uh, Joey Merlino is going to do two years for fucking getting $2,500. Like, are you fucking kidding me? There are fucking people in state public offices, people in government offices that have stolen hundreds of thousands of dollars and they don't get two years. They get six months. So the reality is the Justice Department is flawed. 
The FBI is completely fucking flawed, and there needs to be some sort of reformation on that. And that's really all I can do. Let Carmine the fuck out of jail already. It's ridiculous. 30 fucking, what, 33 years at this point? Come on. There's guys that, Sammy Gravano kills nine fucking people. Look what he does. He gets out, fucking sells drugs, then he gets hammered. But the, the, the point is it needs to be across the board a proven fact, and it's just not in this case. Okay. All that being said, we're going to move on to your questions. Uh, as far as all the questions I got, I got a lot of questions. But because of the show's length, <coughs> excuse me, uh, I had to pick really a lot of a lot of the questions I got were regurgitated. So I'm going to try to get to as many as I can uh, before I move on to Tommy Patera. All right. Question number one. Do you think uh, we have crews like the DeMeos today that we don't know of yet? or those crews mainly in the past. Uh, The 1980s are definitely over. Uh, Listen, I'm not saying for an instant or for a second that there isn't some kind of guy out there that's killing people for the mob and shit like that. The reality is probably so. Uh, But a crew like the DeMeo crew, absolutely not. I think people sort of tend to learn from from the past, Uh, and I think that the mob is such a different uh, group today than it was even back in 1991, that the days of slaughtering six, seven people, chopping them up, are pretty much done. Uh, it would have to be something seriously wacky and goofy for that to happen at this point. You don't even really see, other than Montreal uh, and maybe the thing in the Bronx, you don't see murders like this anymore. Uh, it's not so much that the mob all of a sudden has a morality uh, it's just that they're just too much time. And, and listen, killing a guy over money is the most ridiculous thing to do, especially if it's a loan sharking victim. Uh, listen, you kill a guy, you're not going to get your money. So, you know, it goes both ways here, but I, I just don't think you're ever going to see a crew like the DeMeos anymore. I don't think the, the mob is still powerful in, in many retrospects, but I just think that The mob learns from its past, and I don't think under any circumstance any mob boss in their right fucking mind is going to have a crew that chops up people anymore. Uh, It's just too much heat, and it's just, it's nonsense. All right, question number two, how are you? I think I'm all right. Uh, I've just been busy with um, the show. I've been busy with fucking social media, which I love social media, but I hate it at the same time. I'm like running all the social media by myself, so I'm going to be looking for somebody to hire to run that for me uh, just because that's just going to be a lot easier for me. But that's probably not going to happen until like mid-October. So uh, if anybody's out there and and wants to make uh, some some serious coin, just running some social media, let me know. Reach out to me. Uh, But other than that, I think I'm all right. I'm just working on a screenplay and some other things right now. I've got a lot going on creatively. So uh, the, 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 the show is one thing and then there's the website and then there's got all this other shit that's going on so uh very busy but other than that i think i'm doing okay all right uh how much affiliation do you think uh neil della Croce and sonny francis had with each other being pretty high up in different families listen all mob guys know other mob guys guys in power know the other guys in power uh did they hang out play cards and talk about women probably not uh but if there was a situation where they had to talk about something business wise i think that that's you know, very apparent that they would. Uh, but one of the things that the mob used to do, and I'm not specifically sure, uh, certain families do this today, but usually a soldier could talk to his captain, and that was as far as it went. Then the captain had to talk to somebody who talked to somebody, and eventually it gets back to the boss, and then it filters back down through multiple people. Uh, you sort of had that stop because. Uh, I think it was Carlos Marcello who said it best is that two can keep a secret if one is dead. And I think the reality of bosses uh, talking to underlings is over. Uh, That's the best way that you infiltrate yourself is if it comes through somebody else, then it becomes debatable whether whether you ever said it or not. So I think that that's a good thing to have. I know that Vinny the Chin was like that and some others. Uh, so did they know each other? I'm sure they did, I, I, especially going back to the old days. Uh, you know, Sonny still being alive and all of that. He's, what, 101 at this point? So uh, historically, they probably did talk a lot, but I don't think that it was a situation where they went golfing together, uh, if that makes any sense. Okay, 
Uh, any chance of a show on Frank Lacasio? Okay, here's the deal on Frank. Uh, I am going to be looking at doing something. Uh, this is once again a, a situation where Frank Frankie Loke is is jailed for a bunch of nonsense. Uh, for stuff that he didn't take part in, stuff he admitted that he didn't take part in. The FBI also knew he didn't take part in the De Bono hit, but yet, you know, once again, we see the FBI weave their magic. Uh, Sammy Gravano has recently come out, that pile of shit that he is, that golem looking baldy headed fuck, has come out now and said, well, you know, Frankie Loke didn't do those things. Well, why the fuck are you saying it now? Well, nobody fucking asked me back then. So people have to apparently ask Sammy Gravano back in the fucking day when he first snitches out John Gotti Sr. and everybody the fucking else that if they just asked him, he would have told them. That, that's ridiculous. As a man, you do the right thing. Even if you're a fucking rat and you know the guy didn't have nothing to do with it, why are you going to put murders on somebody that didn't have nothing to do with it? Because Sammy Gravano is a scumbag. That's the first thing. The second thing, he's a fucking rat. The third thing is I don't believe a fucking thing that comes out of his mouth. Listen, he was not called Sammy the Bull because he was tough. He was from Bull's Head, Staten Island. That little fairy tale he likes to tell about, oh, yeah, this kid stole my bike, and I'm look at him, he's like a little bull. It's all bullshit. It's all bullshit. All bullshit. Don't believe it. So, yeah, I am going to try to do something on Frankie Loke here soon. All right, who do you think the toughest guy in the mob was as far as being good with his fists? Probably Tommy Patera. I don't know many people. John Gotti was very good with his fists, too. Uh, John Gotti Sr. was a very tough kid, uh, even going back to the Fulton Rockaway Boys. Uh, if you don't know what I'm talking about, obviously, you can look up the, the Fulton Rockaway Boys. Uh, they were tough kids, tough kids. They came from a different time period. But honestly, do I know anybody that from, from A to B that in the streets? No, because a lot of these guys I talk about are all, you know, before my time, or I was too young to, to know much of anything about them and i obviously didn't see them fight in the streets but i think that john Gotti senior was very reputable in the streets with his fists but tommy patero is like the bruce fucking lee uh on the streets uh and you know and i'm sure there's a whole host of other guys that, that were good with their hands uh but that being uh what it is okay do you think that Mickey Featherstone was justified giving evidence against Jimmy Coonan after the way Coonan treated him? No. I've said this repeatedly, and there's another question coming up that's sort of similar. A rat is a rat is a rat. Uh, I don't think anybody can ever be justified telling on anybody else in any sort of circumstance, and here is my reason why. If you, I said this last week. If you all get in the car together and you know that somebody's going to rob a bank— you're automatically guilty the second you sit in that fucking driver's seat. Even if you don't go in the fucking joint, even if you don't raise a gun or issue an order or nothing, you're just as guilty. You knew what you were doing the second you got in the fucking car. So, from my perspective, doesn't matter that Jimmy Coonan tried to frame Mickey Featherstone for a murder he didn't commit, because that's public knowledge that that happened. But the reality is, is that Mickey Featherstone was going to pay for everything else he had already done. Uh, Jimmy Coonan didn't tell on him. Mickey Featherstone's the one that ratted. So it, justified? Absolutely not. Can I understand it from like an ego perspective of fuck that guy? Absolutely. I totally get it. Uh, that's, that's, I, I think that looking at Mickey Featherstone for who he was, I think he would have been more justified in putting a fucking bullet in the back of fucking Coonan's head. That would have taken care of that right then and there. Uh, but for whatever reason, he decides to become a rat, and you can't justify that to me. Uh, you just you just can't. If you're all fucking, if you're all down for going to the bar and picking up checks, then you're all together. You know what you're doing. Uh, so I, I don't buy this shit for a second of, well, it was justified. Listen, rats are always going to justify. They always do. They always say the same shit. It's never, you know what, I was a bad guy. I made a lot of horrible decisions. I got to pay with for the rest of my life. I'm just trying to make amends with my God or whatever. No, it's always they ratted first. That is every single fucking one of them has said the same thing. They ratted fucking first. So here we go with the fucking the, the schoolyard bully routine again. He talked first. So therefore I fuck fuck him. Come on. Get real. The only reason why you fucking rats because you're a gutless coward piece of shit. Who can't fucking do a day of fucking jail. That's all it is. 
Kevin Weeks. I don't give a fuck what anybody says. I don't give a fuck how bad Whitey Bulger fucked him over. You don't rat. What's the point? You all knew what you were getting involved in, so I cannot justify it on any fucking level. The only time I think you could even justify testifying against anybody to begin with is if you didn't fucking do something and this guy is saying you did. Then you got to defend yourself, by all means. Uh, but no, nah, you can't. You cannot really, cannot really justify it. All right, what are your thoughts on Gene Gotti's release? I have no thoughts, uh, and there's a reason why. He's been in jail almost 30 fucking years. Uh, he's in his 70s. Leave the guy the fuck alone. He hasn't been around since fucking beepers. Okay? And so uh, what Gene does with his life, you know, listen, we all hope he just kind of hangs out with his grandkids, his kids, his wife, and just enjoys whatever time he's got left. Believe me, he's not getting back involved in that that garbage. The The mafia of the 1980s is not the mafia of 20. 20 what what are we 2018 2018 i think i said 2016 earlier jesus christ i'm getting fucking old but yeah the the, the reality is look he's he's done time he's done his time leave him alone already uh people looking to sort of get an edge on what he's gonna do well he's gonna get out of make he's gonna get out of fucking prison I'm sure there's a whole list of shit that he wants to do. He's got to figure out social media. He's got to figure out the internet. Cars are different. I mean, come on. You know, let's be realistic here. What what 72-year-old, 71-year-old is going to get out of prison and go, all right, I've been in fucking prison for 29 years. First thing I'm doing is killing 16 people and collecting loan money. Come on. Get realistic. Uh, all right. Do the Columbos or the Bananos still have an active administration or presence on the street, or have active guys been absorbed by bigger families? Not Colombo still exists, but I still exist, despite the fact that they've had their problems. They have a very active presence on the street. Don't get it twisted. Uh, they're very active. Uh, but no, they have not been absorbed by anybody else at this point. I did hear that 12 Lucchese's were sort of uh, handed to Philadelphia. I don't know how true that is. It's just something I something that got whispered in my ear uh, that 12 guys got transferred. I don't know what the likelihood or reason for that would be. I think that's just more fucking headaches for the guys in Philly. But then again, what do I know? All right. How close was Henry Hill from getting whacked in Omaha when he first located? He really wasn't... Uh, I don't think he was getting close to being whacked at all. Listen, if Jimmy Burke could have whacked Henry Hill and his whole family, he would have done it. But at the time that all of this happened and Henry Hill's in the fucking wind, there's so much heat over Lufthansa and everything else and all the murders that were committed by that crew in general that the last thing the mob was going to do is go after Henry Hill. Uh, would Paul Vario have gone after him? Probably absolutely. Uh, but I think the Italian mafia at that point was... Going through, I mean, obviously, the Lucchese's are going through a major upheaval with those arrests, and Jimmy Burke leaving the streets was 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 not good for the mob in any sense. Uh, they lost a lot of money because of that, uh, and I think that you're just asking for a whole lot of trouble when you try to fucking kill an informant. Uh, if this was an informant in 1950, probably would have been done, uh, but I think at that point, guys were just trying to duck for cover. Uh, how is Carmine Persco doing? Well, I think we answered that at the beginning of the show. All right. What do you think 2019 holds for Philadelphia guys? Do they get jammed up or is this all just fake news spread by others in the media? Uh, if you're talking about Anastasia, he would have you believe that Joey Merlino is going to be a porn star, uh, make a film and, uh, you know, George Borghese and some of the other guys are going to be fluffers for him. I mean, come on, let's get realistic here. Uh, listen, the mob, in the mob life, the street life, there's two things. Jail, uh, there's prison or death. Uh, there's no fucking middle ground there. Uh, 2019, I don't think it's going to be a great year for Philly. And I say that because I think indictments are coming. Uh, when you have multiple snitches in an indictment in, in Jersey, that's bad news. Especially when you look at the indictments themselves and you read the FBI talking about confidential informants being one of which being a made guy in the Philadelphia Mafia, that's a big problem uh, because it's a domino effect. And what happens is one guy snitches, guys get nervous, they start snitching, and it's just sort of a steamroll effect like the snowball going down the hill and all them cartoons. It just gets bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. Uh, 
And I think, realistically, there's going to be more indictments. Uh, I highly suspect at this point, based on the information that I have in front of me, uh, that you're going to be seeing a major player or two go down in this indictment. Remains to be seen. I could be totally wrong. This may not be happening the way that it's sort of being played out to me uh, with people that I know. Uh, but I think that there's there's a reason for, for Philadelphia to be concerned. A lot of it is when you have a fucking pile of shit that is selling drugs in New Jersey, was told, don't sell drugs, stay away from that, and he's caught on a wiretap saying, I don't give a fuck what they say, I'm doing what I want. That's a guy that should be killed uh, if you're going to go by street perspective. Uh, that's a guy that has no respect for authority. That's the guy that has no respect for his crime family. That's a guy that has no fucking respect for himself. Uh, everybody sells drugs, and I get it, but when you're told specifically to stay the fuck away from it, and look, and he says this shit in front of a fucking rat. Of all fucking people, you say it to a rat. So if you look at the indictments, they're talking about several meetings where high-up guys from Philadelphia were in attendance. That's going to be a big problem because if you think for one second the government's going to let that go, you're out of your mind. They've been on Joey Merlino's ass like a fucking tick on a fucking swollen ball bag. Uh, They just will not hesitate. They've been after Merlino since day one, and they always will. Uh, And that's just because the government, this is what they do. Uh, So I think that 2019 probably isn't going to be a great year for them. I'm hoping that whoever is talking sort of forgets names but we all know the reality of that so uh hopefully it goes better but like i said if you believe what anastasia says you know then uh wow just wow they they will insert any fucking name any fucking person uh put fucking monikers on people that aren't realistic uh so listen do they know the mob sure but they don't know them like me they don't know the guys like i know the guys and i think that they're just they're looking for ratings like everybody else uh and that makes them scumbags in my fucking book all right who decides uh when guys get made usually the boss usually the commission will sit down and and open the books or the bosses will open the books uh these days very rare uh and you know it just seems to be the way it is all right what do you think old school mobsters like Lucky Luciano and Carlo Gambino would think of in this modern day mafia? I don't think they would like it. I don't think they would like social media. I don't think that they would like the, the, some of the government rules like the wiretapping now and then the surveillance techniques that the FBI does have. But there's sort of a bigger issue here. And, and the bigger issue in inside of that question is that Luciano and Gambino didn't have the problems that gangsters have today. There wasn't cameras on every street corner the fbi couldn't just tap your cell phone the fbi just couldn't there's so many things and so many technological advances that have been made since their day i don't think gambino or luciano could have survived in today's time period and climate with security measures and and things like that Uh, but i think that if they were alive seeing what they see now i don't think they would like it i I don't think that they would uh, granted everything sort of evolves right so Guys that were doing prostitution back in the 20s and 30s probably wouldn't be now. Now they would be doing porn websites or they would be doing Backpage and shit like that. They would still be involved in that somehow, but like with everything else, everything evolves. Uh, So I think that that's probably as clear as I can get. I I just don't think that they would like what they see. Uh, I think the, the queen of the day, the rats, it's just way too many. Uh, you didn't see that back in the day. You'd see one or two here and there, Valachi being the biggest one, but guys were scared of the mob. Guys took the shit seriously, and I think that there's also a generational gap. And I think that uh, if you look at today's gangster, uh, not all, but some were raised in money, raised by good families, and they just decide to do what they want to do. It's not like 1920 with the Depression. Uh, and you have to feed six siblings and your mother can't work. Your father's disabled. So you have to make your ends meet any way possible. Those days are over. So I think that today's gangster and not all of them. Today's gangster really doesn't have a perception or an ideal. They're living. And I'm talking about somebody who's like a 20 year old gangster has no perception on old the old days. They have no perception on loyalty because a lot of today's youthful 
gangster were raised on Goodfellas and The Godfather. And that's just my opinion. That could get me in a lot of trouble, but that's just my opinion. All right. Was Tommy Patera uh, Spiro's strength in the same way uh, Moretti was Costello's? Or is Spiro strong enough without Patera's backing? Spiro didn't need Tommy Patera. Spiro had a lot of people. Spiro was a tough guy in the streets. Uh, tough guy in general. He didn't need Tommy Patera to get his message across, but that obviously helped him a great deal to get that message across. Uh, so I don't think Sparrow's strength really was so much relied on Tommy Patera. I think that was like the exclamation point of his toughness, but I think Spiro was feared on his own regardless. All right. Uh, which boss was more capable on his own? Uh, without family or just on their own. I think the most capable mob boss I've ever seen in my life was Russell Buffalino. Uh, he didn't have to have killers. He didn't have to have henchmen. He just ran rackets, dumped his money into to profitable, uh, legitimate businesses, and was able to stay the fuck off the radar and do his thing for like 40 fucking years. Uh, very rarely talked about they they don't call him the quiet Don for no fucking reason. Uh, so I think he was probably, I don't want to say the most successful, but he was the most ingenious in saying, you know what, I don't need to get involved in that. That's going to be just putting me out there. So I think all left to his own devices, he would have been fine. I, I don't think he needed 100 fucking 50 guys around him to get shit done. And he didn't. He had a relatively small family. Uh, he used violence when he needed to. Uh, as a last resort, and and I think that just he could he could definitely hold his own regardless. All right. Uh, Sonny Capone was more or less poor after. Uh, okay, Sonny Sonny Capone, who is Al Capone's son, I believe, was more or less poor after uh, his father died. Is that true? What happened to all the Capone money? Capone did not die bankrupt. Uh, to my knowledge, his son was not bankrupt. Uh, this this is something that, that I think we see time and time again. Uh, also, I think that Ralph Capone uh, and some others probably helped Al get rid of some of his money. Uh, but there's long been this thing that Meyer Lansky's children died without a dime. It's, it's all nonsense. It's all bullshit. It's not fucking true. Uh, Lansky had hundreds of millions of dollars. He said he was busted. That's bullshit. Listen, you hide money. That's what you do. You hide the fucking money. Uh, recently, I came across a letter that is actually being auctioned off uh, from Al Capone while he was, I believe he was in Alcatraz, uh, that he wrote to his son, telling his son, he, you know, I miss you, I love you, all this shit, and that you're never going to want for anything the rest of your life. Uh, and it's sort of a sensitive side to Al Capone that you would never suspect that you would see. So you can go online and type in Al Capone letter to son and read it. It's kind of very interesting. Uh, I'm sure they're going to auction it off for a ton of money, but uh, Al Capone was not the type prior to syphilis, even after contracting syphilis to uh, not make sure his son was entrusted with money. Uh, now, whether or not his son squandered a bunch of money, that's something totally different, but I don't believe for one second that, that, uh, that his son was uh, poor uh, at least not from the initial start of his life. Uh, what he did with the money or what was done with the money, I'm not really sure. Uh, but that's not something I can really answer either. All right. Question, a rat is a rat is a rat, but do you consider there to be a difference between ratting like Whitey Bulger as opposed to Sammy Gravano or Greg Scarpa as opposed to Joe Valachi? Are these looked at differently or the same by organized crime guys. Uh, a rat is a rat is a rat. Your first sentence was was absolutely accurate. Listen, mob guys, and it doesn't even have to be mob guys. It's just normal people off the street. I mean, if you tell on somebody for your own gain uh, or to get your own forgiveness, that's as low as it gets. That's lower than a junkie. Uh, you... <laughs> Like I said, unless there's a moral compunction to do it because you want to change your life around, fine. But don't take fucking money when you do it. Don't ask to be, uh, don't ask for a fucking house. Don't ask for a fucking job. Don't ask for fucking hookers, your wife, a new set of tits. Uh, you know, don't don't ask for those things if, if you're going to realistically do this for a moral reason. Uh, but they don't do it for a moral reason. I don't think there's a difference between Joe Valachi 
and Whitey Bulger. I don't think there's a rat is a rat is a rat. And that's as clear and cut as I can get about it. I mean, we could sit here all day and talk about different instances where somebody's going to rat and, and, and do whatever. But uh, reality is, and I don't care what anybody says, the only time you do that is when you're weak. The only time you do it is when you don't want to go to prison. Because what's what's the consequence of, of not ratting? Where do you go? You don't go to California and get a fucking house on a beach in Malibu so you can stare at tits and ass all fucking day. So the reality is you're going to go to a cell where, you know, chances are your ass is going to get roto rootered You know, especially if you're a young guy and you can't defend yourself. So the idea here is, look, you rat. The reason why is because you don't want to go to prison. It was fine and dandy robbing a bank. It was fine and dandy shooting this person, that person. It was fine and dandy running the rackets. But oh my God, I don't want to go to jail. I would think that would be the last of my fucking concerns. Then again, that's me. I live my life a different way. Uh, and and these guys do whatever they do. But, but it's all excuses. All excuses. Never once have I heard uh, one guy come out and say, I read it because I didn't want to do time. Fuck them. They say this shit. Years later, you know, when all the guys they fucking ratted against are dead, they have nothing to be concerned about saying, well, I wanted revenge because they killed so-and-so that was related to me. Bullshit. You can use that as your reason for revenge uh, all day long. That, that, that's a great screenplay. I killed him because he ratted. I, I, I ratted because they killed my father. I, I ratted because they killed my cousin. No, you ratted because you're fucking weak. Because you had no problem being involved in that life Prior to that, that's the life. When you get in, it, it's it's like the fucking army. That's like a motherfucker joining the army saying, oh, yeah, I want to learn how to shoot guns and march in cadence and get good money and good health benefits. Uh, but fuck that shit. If you send me to Afghanistan, there's no fucking way I'm shooting a gun at anybody. Fuck that. I'm not doing that. You know what you signed up for. What are you going to do? Sue the fucking army when you shoot somebody for PTSD when fucking that's your job to defend a country? It's the same principle. If you join a mafia, you're going to murder. You're going to sell drugs. You're going to do all this stuff. You know that ahead of the gate. Before you walk into that fucking social club, start kissing cheeks and ass and kicking back your fucking 20% a month. That's the reality of your job. So how these guys can like fucking curl up like a fucking fetal position and act like a bitch after they've done all this stuff, it just blows my fucking mind. Oh, I didn't mean to do it. Yeah, you didn't mean to pull out a gun and shoot somebody. Yeah, it happens to us all. We've all had that happen on a horrible fucking Sunday when we don't want to go to church. We don't want to fucking do nothing. We're too hungover. I didn't want to shoot the guy, but, you know, come on. Get the fuck out of here. It's the same thing. They know what they're getting involved in. The mafia was a secret thing for hundreds, of, not a hundred years, but for a long time, decades. Joe Valachi helped us out with that one, didn't he? And so now everybody knows that there is something like that that exists. Uh, but you don't know the day-to-day -day politics of what's going on. Because I'm going to tell you what, the, the, the day-in and day-out social club routine, coffee, cards, and bullshitting. Coffee, cards, and bullshitting. Nobody's sitting there saying, yeah, you know, I cut this prick up 600 ways from fucking Sunday. I didn't know what I was going to do with the finger. I had nine bags and I needed ten. And I said, ah, fuck it. So I just threw the fuck. I fed the finger to the dog. Those conversations don't happen. That's fantasy. That's fucking Hollywood. Just not true. So to round it all out, just so that we understand each other, a rat is a rat is a rat. Bring forward one rat who tells me he does it because he feels guilty. Please. And we're going to find out in the show when we come back after a short break. What I mean by if you feel guilty. So we're going to take a break on Mob Talk Radio. When we come back, we are going to be talking about Tommy Patera. And I want to really emphasize this before we get started. Uh, there is a lot that is mentioned about Tommy Patera. There is a book that Philip Car Carlo wrote about Tommy Patera. Did he get it right? Not really. Uh, am I going to get it right? As much as I know, Yes. Uh, but is but a lot of this is is going to be what is publicized and what is out there. I have not uh, had a conversation with Tommy Patera about this show, uh, so a lot of what you are going to hear 
It's probably going to be some regurgitated, regurgitated information, and it's probably likely going to be stuff you've heard before, but a lot of it's coming from court documents and more, uh, and that's just the reality of it. And, and here's the question. Was Tommy Patera a gangster or a serial killer? He was both. And I say that lightly because I went after somebody before for saying that Tommy Patera was a straight-up serial killer and nothing else. Tommy Patera was a fucking gangster. Don't get it twisted, but... Tommy Patera also had this other side to him that was very close to, if not being a serial killer. And we're going to kind of get into that. And I'm kind of going to stray a little bit during the show and talk about the McDonald triad. And there's a reason why I want to talk about that. It has to do with Tommy Patera and how I can make an argument for and against uh, some stuff. So stay tuned to Mob Talk Radio. We will be right back. Uh, also, you can follow us on Twitter at Real Mob Talk 7. Visit us on Facebook. Uh, just type in mob talk radio give us a like give us a subscribe share 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 please uh also over on uh the facebook page and on our twitter and we're also on instagram now at mob talk radio uh i did an interview with scott williams collier of the true crime page yesterday which was posted a really cool interview Uh, i enjoyed it scott's great host as usual yes he's also my partner too uh, but we had a really good conversation about a lot of things, where the show is going to go, uh, what the website's going to look like, and more. So all of that being said, we're going to take a short break, and when we come back, we're going to get into Tommy Patera. Stay tuned on Mob Talk Radio. In my travels, I'm always looking for a clothing brand that I feel like represents me. Anybody can go to a store and buy a t-shirt with a gimmick, but if you believe in three core values like I do, loyalty, honor, and respect, then look no further than Omerta Brand Clothing. You can catch them at Omerta Mia dot com o m e r t a m i a dot com with locations in europe california boston brooklyn florida pennsylvania and washington they have a great clothing line with hats shirts sweatshirts keychains anything you might need stickers you want the rats to stop snitching go right out and get yourself a sticker but if you want to live your life by the gentleman's code look no further than omerta brand clothing and hey, welcome back to Mob Talk Radio. We are going to be talking about Tommy Patera. And really quick, you can follow us at Real Mob Talk 7 on Twitter. Uh, go to Instagram, Mob Talk Radio. You can also check us out on Facebook at uh, just go to your search bar and type in Mob Talk Radio. Give us a like, uh, subscribe, uh, send your comments, your threats, your hatred, and compliments if you actually have any. Uh, over there we have allowed comments to be made on the youtube stuff uh and of course like i suspected within 15 minutes of doing that we had all the rat the rat lovers come out and say a bunch of stupid shit as usual but you know that's to be expected uh also more than likely the web page the new web page new website which is going to also include merchandise uh shirts coffee mugs not just mob talk stuff but some other interesting things that we have planned uh that's probably not going to be online until like the middle of october i'm shooting for october 17th uh but i'm sort of trying to look uh feasibly at some analytic stuff uh just to sort of figure out what the best launch date is uh as far as youtube goes uh I will be on YouTube to some extent. I will probably do free stuff on YouTube like once a month. uh, And all the old shows will remain there. But I do believe as of today, now it can always change, but we are definitely going to move into a uh, personal website and et cetera. So you have that to look forward to. Uh, But with that, let's get to Tommy Patera. Uh, Tommy Patera was born December 2nd, 1954 in Brooklyn, New York. Uh, He grew up in the Gravesend section of Brooklyn. Uh, His father, Joe, was a candy distributor, uh, and his mother, Catherine, was a homemaker. Uh, As a child, and this has been publicly noted, uh, Tommy was a huge fan of the Green Hornet, more a fan of Bruce Lee than anything. Uh, And because of his small frame, he was bullied a lot at school. Now, the reason why this is going to be important is because I think that this, and I'm not a psychoanalyst by any stretch of the fucking imagination, but I think as a psychoanalyst perspective, this is probably most likely the damage that was done to Tommy as a child that would sort of push him in a direction to sort of become who he became. Now, a lot of people say, ah, well, bullying doesn't lead to this. Well, it, it kind of does in a lot of ways. Uh, he was beat up an awful lot uh, at school. He was a very small kid. 
Uh, and he would reach a point in his life where he would actually become a bully rather than being bullied. Um, he was a huge martial arts fan, especially interested in anything Bruce Lee was doing at the time. Uh, and Tommy sort of envisioned himself as someone who could, he wanted to envision himself as somebody who could stop shit. Uh, like if you watch a lot of Bruce Lee films, you know, Bruce Lee gets messed with and Bruce Lee defends himself. Bruce Lee never starts it. Uh, but if it came to it, Bruce Lee would defend himself and do it very adequately. And I think Tommy saw himself sort of in that character is somebody to look up to of somebody who didn't put up with shit, uh, somebody who could fight and, and defend themselves. And I think that's really what Tommy wanted for himself. Uh, another film that Tommy really, really liked that sort of inspired sort of who he became in the end was A Kiss of Death, uh, which was made in 1947. Uh, and the character who sort of gave Tommy an edge was a guy named Tommy Udo. Uh, the Kiss of Death was a was film noir. Uh, the story revolves around an ex-con played by Victor uh, Mature and his former partner in crime, Tommy Udo. Uh, the plot was pretty basic. Uh, the plot took place on Christmas Eve uh, and a down-on-his-luck ex-convict named Nick Bianco and his three co cohorts rob a jewelry store located on the upper floor of a New York skyscraper. Uh, Tommy Udo is a psychopathic killer, uh, and he shows up looking for someone who has been squealing or ratting, uh, and he shows up at this person's mother's home. The mother sort of explains, listen, you know, my son's not here. So what Tommy Udo does, he throws the mother down a flight of stairs, killing her. Uh, eventually, Udo ends up dying in a hail of gunfire from the police, true to a gangster's code of dying with a pistol in the hand. But Tommy really looked at himself like that type of guy. Now, did, did Tommy, and this is my opinion here, but did Tommy like envision himself killing somebody's mother? No, it was about revenge. I think anybody that's ever been bullied uh, in their life or picked one in their life has had this sort of scene run through their head where the bully fucks with them and they end the bully's life or or they hurt the bully and, and all of these scenarios sort of play out. And I think for Tommy, he realized that's who he wanted to be. He wanted to be the guy nobody fucked with, the guy that everybody was intimidated of, the guy that commanded power and respect. Uh, and so when Patera turns 18, he ends up uh, heading towards Tokyo, Japan. And the reason why is he was his parents had paid for him to take martial arts as a child uh, sort of to give him an edge on uh, on the bullying and, and all of that crap. Uh, but he ends up winning a karate tournament in Brooklyn, which ends up funding his trip to Tokyo, Japan. Uh, his dream was to become a martial artist uh, and be just like his idol, Bruce Lee. He spent 27 months uh, with the revered uh, Hiroshi uh, Masumi group. Uh, excuse me, he spent time with... Hiroshi Masumi, who at the time was revered uh, for Kung Fu and Karate and etc. Uh, his trip, like I said earlier, was sponsored by winning a Kumite competition in Brooklyn. Uh, he, Tommy was widely considered to be an expert in the Tanfa, the Nunchucks, and the Katanas. Uh, something that Tommy took very seriously. And one has to wonder if he had just stayed in Japan or if when he came back he didn't get involved in crime what Tommy could have ended up doing either through film or et cetera, et cetera. But we're never going to know because that's not the direction that Tommy went. Uh, after his scholarship ended in Tokyo, Japan, he tried to remain in Tokyo by getting a job uh, working in a chopsticks factory. But ultimately, it didn't work out, uh, and Tommy would return to Brooklyn, a chiseled fighting machine. Uh, he promised himself then that he would never, ever take abuse from anybody ever again. Uh, as he returns to the neighborhood, he begins to frequent mob-owned bars. Uh, he ends up working for Alphonse and Delicato, and Tommy becomes one of the most feared associates around. And the reason why is because not only could Tommy defend himself, but he didn't give a shit. Uh, it was all about money and violence for Tommy at that point. If you're going to impress Alphonse and Delicato, you're going to have to be a nasty individual. And that's exactly what Tommy sort of becomes. Uh, Tommy was willing to do whatever it took, uh, and he was the most feared, and this is a crazy group of people, but out of these people that I'm about to mention, Tommy was more feared than them. Anthony Mira, Alfonso Indelicato, Frankie Lino, and Roy DeMeo. 
uh, Tommy scared all of them. And that's that's saying something, especially when you look at sort of Roy DeMeo, who was in his own right a butcher. Uh, but Tommy scared the shit out of all of them. Uh, Tommy eventually uh, ends up belonging to a crew headed by Alphonse, Sonny Red, and Delicato, Frank Luna, uh, excuse me, Frank Lino, Dominic Trinchera, and Philip Jack- Giacone. Uh, but there were also some issues. Uh, the group of Sonny Red opposed the current leadership under Philip Rustelli and along with Joey Messino and Dominic Napolitano. Uh, in 1981, Messino and Napolitano set up the murders of the three rival captains in a club in Brooklyn, which was owned by Sammy Gravano and Eddie Garofalo. After the hit, and also involved in that, was Vito Rizzuto, uh, after the hit, Messina would make peace with the rest of the factions, which included Tommy Patera. Tommy Patera was a lot of things for Joey Messina. Not only could Tommy Patera kill and was willing to kill, but Tommy Patera had a uh, a gumption. He could make mer- he could make money. He could earn. He knew how to earn. So we've always talked about on this show that to be in that life, you have to be one of two things. You either have to be a killer or an earner. If you're neither one of those things, what the fuck do they need you for? Uh, th- this is sort of a, a tongue-in-cheek conversation I had the other day with somebody uh, who said, ah, you know, he wasn't a murderer. He was a soft guy. He never made any money. He was always broke. Well, then what the fuck was he doing around those guys? Listen, nobody brings around anybody if they can't make them money and they aren't willing to kill. It just doesn't make any sense to me. It never has. Uh, they don't bring around guys to be a fucking mascot. Well, maybe one guy I know of was a mascot to some people. Uh, but if you're not bringing in money and you can't kill, they have no use for you. Uh, during the 1980s, Tommy Patera would get his get made for committing multiple murders. Tommy would then be reassigned to Anthony Spiro, who then in turn would hand Tommy over to Frank Lino. Uh, Tommy knew Frank Lino, excuse me, Frank Lino for a long time. Uh, and so now he is under Anthony Spiro's umbrella. Uh, August of 1988, uh, Tommy kills uh, Wilfred Willie Boy Johnson uh, as he walked to his car. Johnson had been a close associate of John Gotti, but Johnson was outed at a criminal trial for John Gotti as have, having been an informant since 1966. Uh, Patera would end up shooting Johnson nine times as a favor to, to John Gotti. Uh, the reason why they went outside the family t- uh, to Patera, well, Patera could get business done. Patera didn't mince words. Patera didn't mind handling it. Uh, it probably needed to come from an outside source, especially, especially when you consider that Willie Boy Johnson was an informant. Uh, one of the things that, it, it, and this goes back to the beginning of the show, but one of the things that aggravated me about the way that the government handled Willie Boy Johnson is okay he's a rat I get it but what they essentially did was try to force Willie Boy Johnson into testifying against John Gotti Uh, Willie Boy Johnson would end up not doing that but the reality is is that he had been feeding the FBI information since 1966 and allowed to operate on the streets and make money uh, without being interrupted by anything there were arrests that were made that he skated on that he shouldn't have uh, but this is what the FBI did. Uh, Jack alone is the prosecutor that, that did this. Essentially, they realized that Willie Boy may not testify and they need him to. He's the one that's provided the information. He's the one that can corroborate the information. But ultimately, he's sort of backing out. Uh, and so the FBI thinks it's a wise idea not to grant him bail because uh, what would be coming out was that he had been an informant since 1966 and it would surely get him killed. Uh, the FBI didn't seem to give a shit about that. Uh, they wanted the the ends needed to justify the means in that situation. And ultimately, what ends up, what ends up happening? Willie Boy gets killed. Uh, now, granted, you you can't really, uh, you know, Tommy Patera is the one that killed him. Uh, obviously, the order came, so we know those two facts. But why isn't the FBI held as an accomplice in that murder? They outed him. Like, what good reason? would they have for outing him other than to try to put pressure on him to testify and do something they wanted. So essentially, by coming out with that at the trial, they essentially put the death penalty on top of Willie Boy's head. 
Uh, call it what you want. You may say, well, you know, somebody else killed him, so you can't blame the government for somebody else doing something. But you can because the government put it out on the streets. Nobody knew. Nobody knew he was testifying or, excuse me, ratting or giving up information. They only found out because of the government. So that bitch Jack alone should be in prison for that uh, because she directly contributed to his demise. That's the reality. That's that's the type of shit that, that I was talking about at the beginning of the show. All right. So Patera was very close to Anthony Spiro. Uh, or excuse me. Let me step back one second. Uh, Tommy Patera ultimately was charged with the murder of Willie Boy Johnson, but he would actually be acquitted of that murder. Uh, I don't know how the hell that happened, but it's publicly known he was acquitted of it. Okay. Patera was very close to Anthony Spiro, who at the time was uh, the Bonanno uh, crime family consigliere. Uh, Spiro headed up a violent Bath Beach crew. Uh, the group was involved in loan sharking, extortion, narcotics, and murder. Now, a lot of the questions that I do get is how come I don't talk about the Bath Avenue crew? I have no problem talking about Tony, you know, Anthony Spiro. I'm not going to talk about Paulie Galino and Jimmy Calandra. They're, they're, it just, they're, it's nonsense. I don't have a lot of respect for those guys. And here's why. Uh, Paulie Galino, A, shoved, put his hands on Anthony Spiro. That's why he was killed. Calandra at the time was locked up. Uh, Calandra got scared because he had to have realized that Spiro was going to have him killed and he could use Tommy Patera to do it. Uh, so that's why Calandra ends up ratting. Uh, but the thing is, is that, you know, you, you bring in uh, Chris Ludwigson, Ludwig, excuse me, Chris Ludwigson, uh, who went by the street name of Chris uh, Paciello, uh, Paciello, uh, they killed an elderly Jewish lady by breaking into her house and shot and killed her. That's not a mob hit. That's not a mob tactic. These guys are breaking and entering like a bunch of fucking street corner dopes. How many fucking mob guys do you know break into houses and then kill an elderly Jewish lady when they, for whatever reason, uh, these guys also did bank robberies and et cetera. Uh, so there's always, so the reason why I don't cover it is because I don't consider them to be much. Were they tough guys? Absolutely. Nobody's saying that these guys weren't tough in any stretch of the fucking imagination. They were, I'm just not going to waste time, uh, doing a show on those guys because it, at the end of the day, they weren't gangsters as far as I'm concerned. It's just uh, the way I feel about it. That and Jimmy Calandra is a giant fucking asshole. Uh, you know, that being said, not only is he a rat, he's an asshole on top of it. Uh, all right. So Tommy and his crew were notorious for robbing drug dealers. He was really the first guy, not the first guy ever to come along and do it, but he was really the first guy who realized, you know what? We got a lot of tough guys. I'm willing to kill anybody. Let's just start robbing the drug dealers and then reselling the drugs. Uh, there's an infamous rat who is out there selling this sort of story, uh, which he ripped off directly from Tommy Patera. This is the same guy who said that he robbed Tommy Patera, which is a lie. Uh, and I'm not going to go into it any more than that. Uh, because, listen, Tommy Patera was a feared fucking guy. Uh, people were petrified of Tommy Patera. He wouldn't fucking hesitate. So when people s sort of tell these stories about how they got over on somebody else, all that is is designed for is to, to pad their stats to make them look tougher than they really were. And that's the truth. Believe me, nobody robbed Tommy Patera. Uh, so anyway, his crew was notorious for robbing drug dealers and then obviously reselling the drugs. Uh, Tommy Patera would even then... Uh, go so far as to murder a Colombian drug kingpin. He would steal the drugs and then he would resell. Something, there was a situation where he killed a Colombian drug kingpin. Uh, they steal his shipment and it was 40 pounds of cocaine and they ended up reselling that. Uh, after that, Patera would end up uh, killing uh, Tala Siksik, who was a Middle Eastern drug supplier as well. Uh, once again, stealing his load and, and turning around and selling it. Uh, this was also the first murder that Patera committed where he dismembered, uh, where dismemberment would actually take place. Dismemberment was not something that Tommy Patera started with. Uh, it's sort of how he uh, grew into his role. And, and this is sort of where I want to deviate a little bit before I go back into Tommy's story a little bit. There is something. Uh, called the McDonald Triad, and I mentioned it probably earlier on in the show. 
the McDonald the McDonald Triad was designed by a guy who worked as an FBI profiler, and what they were looking for is what was the commonalities uh, with serial killers. Uh, your Jeffrey Dahmer's, your John Wayne Gacy's, uh, your Richard Ramirez's, uh, your Juan Coronas, uh, your Dennis Raiders. Uh, I, I could go on and on and on and talk about serial killers. Uh, but the triad basically was three things that all of these people had in common. Uh, and, and I'm going to branch a little bit here, so just hold on with me. You'll, you'll totally understand where I'm going once I get there. The first thing was all of them seem to have wet the bed. And not everybody has the same three, but there's one, one or two of the three things that they do have. The three things were abuse as a child, either physically, sexually, or emotionally abused as a child. Uh, they wet the bed uh, it, constantly. Uh, and the third one, uh, the, one of the third ones was abuse to animals. Uh, those seem to be the three things that each serial killer has in common. Now, if you look at Jeffrey Dahmer, for instance, he didn't have a bad childhood. Not at all, but he tortured animals. See, so he has one thing of the triad, which led to him getting to be something else. When Jeffrey Dahmer committed his first murder, it, it was not, uh, it was a sexual thing. Uh, it was a, he wanted sort of ownership over a body sort of thing. But he didn't start off eating people. He didn't start off like uh, tying people up and drugging them. He ended up evolving to that. Uh, serial killers have this innate nature of how they start is not how they end. As they get better and as they hone their craft, I hate to say it like that, but that's what they do. When you hone a craft, you get better and better and better at what you're doing. You get better at hiding the bodies. You get better at your methodology as far as how you're going to kill somebody. Uh, you get better at scrubbing the scene. You get better at not leaving details. Uh, not all ser serial killers, for example, keep mementos of murders, but that is one of the underlying traits that serial killers have because they want to remember the murder. They want to relive in that moment. So when I say that we're getting to that point sort of in this story is because how Tommy started is not how he ended. There were going to be, first of all, Tom, you got to look at his childhood. He was abused by a lot of different people, not his family, from what I understand, but just the public shaming of being a small kid, getting beat up all the time. Those are two things that designed the right way can cause implosions inside of your brain to, to cause you to react and do things. Then you add somebody like a woman to the mix, and it just is like a time bomb waiting to go off. Uh, and as we move further along, you'll you'll see what I mean. And, and we'll talk a little bit more about the triad and, and et cetera here in a second. Okay. Uh, Tommy would end up taking the body of Talisa Sick uh, and put it in the tub, and he would fillet the body parts. Uh, fillet. Uh, fillet. I mean, who does this? Fillets the body part body into six parts. Then he would bury it at a secret dumping ground. Uh, investigators would eventually find six of Patera's 60 likely vi vi victims in a mob graveyard in Staten Island uh, near William T. Davis uh, Wildlife Refuge. Uh, Patera had decapitated the bodies and buried the head separately to impede identification using dental records. Now we're sort of getting into a gray area. It's no longer about shooting a guy twice in the head, leaving his body in the streets. Uh, Tommy has gone from simply murdering somebody to now dismemberment, going from dismemberment to putting a head in another location. Uh, he's gone from digging, you know, minor holes to six foot holes. So what you're seeing is a natural progression to his violence. He doesn't start dismembering. That's where he ends up. So there's all these little, little notches in between of where Tommy gets to. But if you look at this from an external point of view, mob guys typically don't do a couple things. They don't kill women, which Tommy did. We'll get to, to that here shortly. Uh, but a lot of mob guys don't keep mementos of their victims. Tommy did that. And that's one of the, the interesting traits that all serial killers somewhat, not all of them, but the majority of them keep some sort of semblance of the crime that they commit. And Tommy was doing that. That's not 
that's not your average mob killer. I don't think Sammy Gravano uh, or Al Capone or Albert Anastasia took mementos from a murder scene. Tommy did. So he went from sort of being a mob killer to something completely different. Uh, and I'm going to fill in a couple of gaps here and there. Okay. Uh, Tommy's approach to mob hits and to even body disposal were very controlled. And that's, that's another thing. When, when somebody just kills somebody in the heat of the moment, the scene is a disarray. There's shit everywhere. Nobody attempts to clean up anything. They just call the police and they say what happens. But with Tommy, he went almost immediately from having a controlled crime scene. That is another fucking interesting facet to who Tommy Patera was. Okay, yeah, you don't want to get caught for the murder. I, I understand. But he literally was called an expert by the FBI in murder and dismemberment. Uh, he just knew how to dispatch people in a way where he wouldn't get caught. And that's not, uh, I, I don't think gangsters are that meticulous. I think it's shoot the guy, get rid of the body. Tommy went to the extreme to ensure that he wouldn't get caught. In fact, he was so fucking intelligent that he knew that the soil in Staten Island was moist. And he knew because the soil was so moist in Staten Island that decom decomposition would happen at a faster rate. This is not your thinking of your average mob killer. This is the thinking of a fucking psychopath. Uh, I don't think Jimmy Burke was like, yeah, let's stick him in the soil over here. He decomposes quicker. We'll be fine. This is not average thoughts from a guy who kills somebody over money or a drug deal or whatever. This just isn't, and I'm sure it's happened, but it's just not rational on that level. Uh, investigators would find books in Tommy's house about murder uh, and mayhem. Patera studied books on torture, dissection, uh, the Butcher's Guide to Human Anatomy. Uh, he would even carry uh, a doctor-like bag, uh, which contained knives for cutting up bodies. Uh, he always insisted on burying his his bodies beyond six feet so that cadaver dogs would not be able to hit a scent at the crime scene. Uh, and for the body parts, he would either use a suitcase or he would use plastic. Once again, this is not your average mob killer. Uh, your average mob killer isn't going to have books like Torture, Dissection, The Butcher's Guide to Filleting Bodies and stuff like that. Uh, like I said earlier, Patera kept jewelry uh, as souvenirs, identification, which he had hidden in his apartment. Uh, and this is exactly what makes Tommy Patera more than likely a serial killer. Uh, Tommy Patera, first of all, they, they cannot confirm 60 victims, but that's what they believe. Uh, 60 victims is not your average mob hit. Gravano, 19 murders. Uh, Albert Anastasia, probably a couple of hundred. But physically doing it himself, Albert Anastasia didn't. Uh, nine, 19 murders Gravano didn't even participate in. He, he participated to the extent where he pulled the trigger in a couple and he helped bury evidence or knew about it or set it up. Uh, but this is a situation where Tommy killed every single one of them on his own or with help from others. But Tommy did it uh, on it at his own behest. Uh, and not all of these mob murders uh, not all of these murders were mafia related murders. Some of them were very, very personal uh, murders. Uh, but Tommy was a gangster to to the extent that he could earn a lot of money. But I think what it's going to overshadow his legacy is the sick shit that he did uh, to his victims. It, it wasn't a mere just, okay, you, you're going to listen to me because I'm Tommy Patera. It went in kind of a whole nother direction. And I don't think, even with the DeMeo crew, uh, as egregious as some of the shit that they did, Tommy took it one level further than they did. Uh, Tommy was a fantastic earner uh, and his willingness to kill uh, made him a valuable asset uh, to the crime family. Uh, not only would he kill, not only could he kill, he wouldn't hesitate, but he also made them an incredible amount of money. And the other thing is, is that he terrified the majority of the people involved. When you can control the people that you're around by fear, that's the ultimate. Okay, he makes us a lot of money, and eh, maybe he's killing people he shouldn't, but who was going to fuck with Tommy Patera? 
people were terrified of him. Uh, in 1990, Patera would be indicted for heading a narcotics trafficking crew uh, and for his involvement in seven murders, including the murder in 1988 of Willie Boy Johnson. Uh, investigators believed that Tommy was involved in at least 60 murders. His crew sold 300 pounds of cocaine a year, multiple kilos of heroin, and a ton of marijuana. Uh, when the FBI raided Tommy's apartment, they found 60 automatic weapons, knives, swords, books, uh, such as the Hitman's Handbook or Kill or Be Killed, Torture, and a book on dismembering bodies. Uh, so how does Patera get caught? Because we know, we know, for instance, that how Tommy sort of meets mob guys, what he ends up sort of kind of doing. How does he end up getting caught? He ends up getting caught because of Frank Ganji. Now, for those who know me, know that Frank and I have always had sort of a, a dialogue that's either okay or just absolutely fucking insane. Uh, Frank is a rat. Frank knows he's a rat. I've called rat uh, Frank a rat. Frank acknowledges uh, that he was an informant. The difference between, say, Frank Ganji and, say, your other average rat uh, was considering who Tommy was. Uh, he was around somebody who was brutal, a psychopath, did some very, very sick shit. And Frank didn't get a sentence reduction uh, for testifying. That's a major difference. Now, Frank asked for one, but the judge relented and says, no, you know, you, you helped murder five people. You're not getting a deal. So Frank didn't get a deal. Now, what Frank did tell the judge got Tommy Patera locked up for the rest of his life. So on that front, he, he's a fucking rat. Uh, but to say that Frank got uh, any relief, I think, is, is sort of nonsense because I don't think he does. Frank is a, uh, a very haunted guy. Frank's got a lot of problems. Uh, you know, getting out of prison after uh, for being involved in five murders, should he have gotten out? Absolutely not. But probably more than likely, I, I think it's certifiable that the reason why he did was because he testified. But he didn't get a deal uh, per se from the judge by saying, well, thank you for your testimony. We're going to give you five years and you can go. Now, Frank, I think, did close to 20 years. Uh, okay. So Frank was Rosario uh, Ganji's nephew. Rosario Ganji was a capo in the Genovese crime family. Um, as Frank exited prison for a prior murder, he ended up needing money and needed to get back to work. Uh, and he had heard from some people that, that Tommy was the guy to go and see. So he went to Tommy's club, ends up sort of meeting Tommy, and, and they kind of become partners in crime. Uh, Frank pretty much would be stuck along for the ride. Uh, Frank had seen multiple murders and mayhem to the point where he was using coke and using alcohol to ease his mind to deal with what was going on. Uh, and what ends up happening is there was an incident that took place uh, with Phyllis Birdie. Uh, and I'm kind of going to go into that uh, in a second. But ultimately, Frank was driving. He was drunk. And he gets pulled over and he just starts talking immediately. Just starts telling the cops everything they ever wanted. They didn't know what the fuck he was talking about. But he just started basically informing on Tommy right then and there as soon as he got pulled over. Uh, I had asked Frank at one point why he did that. And his exact response to me, and I believe it to be the truth, uh, is that he couldn't deal with it. He couldn't deal with the visions, the nightmares he was having, the fucking replayed scenes in his brain. Uh, and somebody had to put Tommy to a stop because Tommy wasn't your average mob guy. Tommy was a fucking serial killer on top of it. Uh, I think that one may argue that Frank probably, uh, Frank obviously was responsible for at least five people dying. Uh, but at the same time, think about how many people that he might have stopped from being killed by saying what he said. So we can make an argument two or four. I don't listen. I don't respect an informant. I don't like informants. I don't like what Frank did. Uh, but that's an entirely different situation than Sammy Gravano was in. It's an entirely different situation than Joe Valachi was in. I'm not saying it makes it any more acceptable because it doesn't. A rat is a rat is a rat. But I just like to point out the facts because a lot of people... Don't point that out. Uh, let's see. So uh, he was basically pulled over for DUI suspicion. He just started spilling his guts completely. Uh, and it was Frank's words that got Tommy ultimately arrested. Uh, 
and Frank would become a cooperator and end up testifying against Tommy Patera. Um, Frank, when sitting down with the authorities, just sort of recounted what happened to Phyllis Birdie as matter-of-factly, like it was chewing gum um, while she was asleep in his bed after a night of partying. So here's the background on how that all went down. Uh, Tommy was uh, married to a girl named Celeste, and Celeste had a lot of problems. She was a drug addict, uh, and Tommy was completely head over heels in love with her. Uh, by all accounts, she was Tommy's world. The problem was, like I said, Celeste had a huge drug problem, cocaine specifically being the issue, uh, speedballing as well, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, it seemed like every time that Celeste was sort of high, it was because she was hanging out with Philip Birdie. Uh, left to her own devices, she wasn't getting high, but, but any time her friend Phyllis Birdie came around, you know, they just started doing lines of coke, got all crazy, and Tommy tried in vain for a long time to sort of get Celeste away from Philip, or excuse me, from Phyllis Birdie, and he just didn't have any luck, luck doing it. Uh, he had even threatened Birdie a couple of times, and she didn't kind of get the message. And then one night, what ends up happening is she ends up sneaking out and going and meeting Phyllis Birdie at a bar. Uh, and what ends up happening is they go from the bar to deciding they want to do some drugs, and Phyllis Birdie, they go to Phyllis Birdie's house, uh, they get coked up, and Celeste overdosed and died on the spot. Uh, Tommy was called by a friend, and when he arrived, he saw Celeste's body there. Uh, he ran over, grabbed her body, and started screaming and crying and cradling his wife in his arms. And then he sees Philip Birdie walk out of a back room, stumble and bumbling, and he immediately tries to go after her. The cops intercede, and then he tells Phyllis Birdie, I'm going to fucking kill you. Uh, Frank Ganji has stated on record that Birdie did get the message and pretty much left town for a long time, uh, which made him happy because he did not want to be involved with killing a woman, and he knew that Tommy Patera, under no circumstances, uh, was going to let this go. Uh, so moving ahead a couple of months later, uh, Frank Gaggi sitting in a bar and who he looks up and there's Phyllis Birdie sitting at the end of the bar. They end up hanging out. Uh, she heads, heads back to Frank's house with him. They do drugs and get it on all night. And the next morning the phone rings and Frank picks up the phone and it's Tommy just checking in to see how things are. And it really freaked Frank out because he thought that Tommy knew that Phyllis Birdie was in the apartment. So he thought, well, fuck, Tommy's going to fucking kill me because he's been looking for this this fucking broad all over the place. So what Frank does, be out of, probably out of fear more than anything of his own life, tells Tommy, you're never going to believe who's here right now. And he says, Phyllis Birdie. So Tommy Patera says, keep her fucking there. I'll, I'll be right, you know, I'll be right over, blah, 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 blah. Uh, and more or less what happens is Tommy uh, comes over and while she's sleeping, Tommy puts o comes over and uh, shoots her in the back of the head twice. And then he takes her into the fucking bathroom and dissects her, cutting her into six parts. And then he takes the fucking head and puts it in a bag. That head would ultimately be placed in Tommy Patera's refrigerator. So every time that he opened it, he could look at that head and say, See, I told you I'd get even. That's not normal. Under any circumstances, that's not normal. You tell me any other mobster that's done that. That is the one single solitary thing. Even if we look at keeping uh, identifications, uh, excuse me for one second. All right. Even if we look at all the things he did, dismembering, okay, DeMeo and them kind of did that. I get it. Uh, but they didn't keep souvenirs from the victims. Uh, that's one thing Tommy did. Uh, the DeMeo crew didn't have books wall to wall on dissection, dismemberment, hitman's guide to whatever. That's another interesting thing that Tommy has, but none of them kept a fucking head in a fridge. Who does that shit? That's where, that's the one instant where I could say Tommy can be separated at that point from mafia shit. That's just absolutely unequivocally, not something that average killers uh, do. So what ends up happening is Ganji would also tell investigators that Patera uh, killed uh, Merrick, Merrick Chaharsky, who was a drug dealer, 
uh, and stabbed him a hundred times before cutting his throat. So once again, we're seeing a rage and an anger. Now, most importantly, I think we need to go back to something. Uh, prior to Celeste dying of a drug overdose, Tommy did dismember bodies, but it wasn't to the point where it was ritualistic, uh, a part of the norm. Yeah, dismembering a body here and there, yep, got to do what we got to do. But now he's taken it a step further because he's been abused as a kid. All right, we know that. He gets out. He's going to be tough and not put up with any bullshit. Falls in love. The next thing you know, the person that he loves the most in this world has now died of a drug overdose. So anything that he remotely cared about. Now, he did have a child with a prior woman who he had no involvement with. But putting him in that position, he's now he's lost everything. His world. Now he's got nothing to come back to, nothing to look forward to. So he's just going to kill. And he's no longer killing for street purposes this was a murder of revenge this was uh i'll get you bitch type of moment uh and then he puts the head in the fridge which totally like i said separates him from uh mob guys that that's not um that's stuff serial killers do uh once again we, you know we see that america chaharsky he stabs a hundred times he stabs him a hundred times before he cuts his throat so that's a very personal when you start looking at, at murder scenes and stuff like that that's a personal thing people don't get that when you're creating or committing a murder most mob guys will shoot you and run away or or grab you and bury you somewhere else but this is to to stab somebody a hundred times and then cut their throat that is personal that's intentional uh, and whoever is committing the crime has serious anger problems. Uh, and that's just another one of those little traits that sort of s jumps off in the spoke of things from the McDonald triad. Uh, during the trial, prosecutors demanded the death sentence for Tommy Patera. But Tommy Patera's attorney would argue that the death penalty should be rejected because Patera had no prior criminal record that other participants in the murders were allowed to plead guilty to lesser charges, specifically uh Richard Leone and Solomon Stern, who were killed March 15th of 1989, uh, after the federal death penalty went into effect. So the argument that the attorney is making is, look, Tommy had no prior criminal record, and Frank Ganji and some of these other guys that were involved in this crew took lesser charges. Uh, also, the two murders of Solomon Stern and Richard Leone uh, happened in 89, which is after the federal death penalty law went into effect. So his attorney had a really, really, really good argument. Uh, the four other murders that took place, uh, the, the four other murders took place prior. Uh, so those counts carried a maximum of sentence, sentences of life in prison. So that's once again, the argument for the death penalty. Patera's aunt and sister-in-law and cousins would actually go in and testify that Patera was a loving and caring, caring family member, uh, which is to be expected from family. On June 25th of 1992, Patero would be convicted of murdering six and supervising a massive drug dealing operation in Brooklyn. Patero would then be acquitted on the hit of Willie Boy Johnson. Uh, the jury would reject the death penalty, which was a win for Tommy Patera. In October of 1992, the judge sentenced Patera to life in prison uh, without parole. As the judge announced his sentence, Patera laughed and gave a thumbs up to reporters. Tommy didn't give a shit at that point. Uh, Patera was irate when Frank Ganji asked for a prison sentence reduction, even though Frank helped commit six murders. Uh, and here's a direct quote from Tommy Patera. Uh, God, th this is what he said to the judge. Ganji said he wasn't sorry about the killing. Five, he wasn't sorry about killing five people and that he became an informant because he wanted to start a new life. He gets 10 years, a good deal, and goes on whimpering and weeping, weeping to, the, to you, your honor looking for a break if you're really sorry for killing six people take your fucking punishment like a fucking man uh and not six people five people so uh you know so Tommy makes a really good argument to the judge saying why are you giving this guy a deal you know if he wants to start a new life and he wants to change uh, where was his guilt for killing five people uh where where is 
Where where does this guy get off trying to ask for a sentence reduction when he should just do his time like a man, take a, a credibility and responsibility for the murders he committed? That doesn't make him a man. That makes him a weasel and a, and, and a fucking bum. He should just take his punishment. And the judge ended up, I'm not saying that this was any relation to the decision, but the judge, I think, sort of agreed, and he didn't give Frank Ganji uh, a deal at all. Uh, in 1992, uh, a judge refused to reduce Ganji's sentence, then on April 3rd of 2012, the Second Circuit Court of Appeals denied Tommy Patera's petition for DNA testing in those crimes that he was convicted of. Uh, the judge would end up saying uh, that's not going to happen. Uh, but, but more or less, Tommy wanted to try to prove that maybe he didn't have anything to do with those murders. So where does that leave us in the grand scheme of things uh, as far as Tommy Patera goes? Uh, obviously, he's serving life in prison without parole. Uh, currently, he is locked up at USP McCreary in Pine Knot, Kentucky. Uh, he's selling paintings and et cetera online. Uh, but the reality is uh, that do informants lie? Absolutely. We've said that a hundred times, a million times on this show. And if we're going to believe that and, and say that and be believable, then we have to almost make an assumption of was Frank Ganji telling the truth? Uh, in this case, I think Frank was in, in certain aspects. Uh, I think that testimony is often manipulated. Uh, and I'm not going to put words in anybody's mouth, but I think that the reality of how Tommy started to where he ended was quite interesting. Uh, we go back to the beginning of the show when I said Tommy Udo pushed the kid's mother down the fucking flight of stairs. The Tommy Patera that joined the mafia wouldn't have done that, but the Tommy Patera post Celeste overdosing was exactly like that. It is art and it's best form imitating life. Uh, and listen, I know I've said on the record before that when people bash, bash Tommy Patera and said he was a serial killer, I got a little angry because he was more than that. Uh, but that's how he ended up. Uh, and we could sit here and digest it, digress it, and, and sort of talk about all the little interesting things that he did. But there's a couple of points I just want to make before we close out the show. Uh, is that Philip Carlo's book, he didn't talk to Tommy Patera. Uh, so a lot of what he talked about in his book was taking from court transcripts and talking to other people. Uh, and in and, and, and every book that's ever written, there's always some merit and always a value, a value. Remember, every myth and every legend in life always stems from some sort of truth, right? So uh, the idea here is that the point blank question, was Tommy Patera a gangster or was Tommy Patera a serial killer? You really can't answer that for 100%. Because as he started as a gangster, a very good gangster as far as being able to earn and kill, but is that where he ended up? Is that the the, the fucking trajectory that he was on? Uh, you look at his first couple of murders, gunshots, dismemberment, body goes away. But he slowly but surely begins to manifest and fucking evolve into something different. He goes from killing for a reason to killing for revenge he goes from killing guys in that walk of life to killing a woman now we can argue all day long uh how stupid phyllis birdie was to come back around to brooklyn after pretty much she was issued a death threat uh by tommy but ultimately at the end of the day tommy held her accountable for what celeste did now we all know that there are lots of people in this world that do drugs uh, but listen, nobody ever put a gun in nobody's mouth and made him smoke crack. That's just reality. Uh, but the fact that Tommy was so enamored, I think, with Celeste clouded not only his judgment, but this was an impulsive, rage-filled sort of killing. Uh, and I think that ultimately it was that killing right there that made Frank Ganji do what he did. Uh, should Frank have told? No, Frank shouldn't have told. He should have just you know, kept his mouth shut because prior to that, the FBI really was not on top of Tommy Patero a whole lot. Uh, he was known, but it wasn't like he was beeping on the radar. Uh, but I think that given the situation and I've never been in a situation being around a guy who's killing people nonstop. So I can't tell you what I would do. I wouldn't be around somebody like that. I think after the first time I see that I go the other direction. I don't see nothing. I don't hear nothing. Uh, but this is a situation that's a little different. Uh, you're not dealing with uh, your garden variety gangster who's selling drugs, earning high-end money, killing when he needs to kill. This is a guy that was killing to facilitate uh, an emotion, and that's 
different. Uh, all murders, you know, are emotional and, and they have their devices in emotion and rooted in emotion. Uh, but this guy just completely went off the fucking reservoir. Uh, so I think an interesting question might be, looking at it the way I am, is that if Frank Ganji doesn't doesn't rat, does Tommy just keep killing? And I think that he, I think he was just getting started. Uh, you know, and it'll be interesting to see as the years go forward what the FBI comes up with. Uh, and I don't think anybody's really going to ever fucking know why Tommy did what he did. Uh, I think that being bullied as a kid probably had a lot to do with it. But I also think at some point you have to have some sort of uh, conscience. And I don't think Tommy has one of those. There's there's some mob guys that uh, me and my friend Elio talk all the time about people we've met, people we know. Those type of people all have the same look in their eyes. It's a very, very cold uh, look. They may smile. But their eyes say something totally different. And you can always pick those guys out immediately out of the crowd. Uh, these are guys that don't have a compun- they don't have a compunction about murder at all. They don't have any sort of feeling about killing you or your family. They're just people. Some people are just like that. And, and I'm guessing that many of the people that listen to my show have probably met somebody like that once or twice in their life. They just kind of have a weird buzz bzz, about them. They're, they're off. Uh, and those are people that are dangerous. Uh, the ones that are calculating and, and use murder as a method for business, that, that that's one thing. But but with Tommy, you know, he starts that way and then he drifts off in, into this fucking oblivion uh, that completely is just uh, a little disturbing, I'll be honest with you. But uh, but I think if, if somebody asked me point blank, okay, well, was he this or was he this? I'm not going to tell you he's one or the other. He was both. He was both. Now, where he would have gone... Who knows? Maybe he would have gone back to the left a little bit and just been a gangster and left it at that. Or maybe he just goes completely off to the right. But I think that the minute he kills Phyllis Birdie is the end of Tommy. At least it's the end of... It, the, the minute Celeste dies, it's the end of Tommy as a person and of Tommy as, as a gangster. And then Tommy becomes something totally different. Uh, I wish there was more to talk about when it came to Tommy Patera. I wish that there were... Uh, a lot more tidbits, but the what I didn't want to do was use any parts of Philip Carlo's book because a lot of what he said was unsubstantiated. Uh, I could have easily reached out to Frank and talked to Frank, but I don't give it out with the rats. I never have. I never will. I shouldn't say I never have. I have before in the past, but I won't do it because uh, a lot of the things that I believe in, I just can't. You know, yeah, I could have a guy on and like shoot the shit and scream at him. Yeah, you're a fucking rat. What does it matter? Uh, but to me, at the end of the day, it's uh, is it would it be beneficial for me to talk to them? No, not in the slightest. And I've talked to Frank over the years about things uh, just to pick his brain. Uh, Frank's an interesting guy. He's a funny guy. He's a highly volatile fucking guy. Uh, but what I can tell you is, and and I believe this, and it's. Uh, what I believe in my core is I don't think Frank really looks back on those sort of things with any sort of reverence. I don't think he is proud of what he became. Uh, I don't think he ratted entirely because he couldn't do jail time. Frank had done jail before. He'd done time for a murder before. So what's another one? I mean, I, I don't think that that was... A, I don't think Frank wanted to go to jail, but I don't think that that was the sole thing behind what he was trying to do. Uh, I'm not saying that he should get special permission or he should get forgiveness. I'm not saying any of that. He's got to live with the shit he did, right? Uh, he's got to live with his involvement in all of them murders. I don't. But I think of all the people I've ever come across in this lifestyle, uh, even guys that are active now, I've never met a guy like Frank who I think is being honest for the most part. Uh, there's listen, guy, things are always going to be tailored a certain way to make yourself look more innocent. But Frank has never really been the guy to to lay blame and point a finger at Tommy or to point a finger at the FBI or to point a finger at everybody else. He points it at himself first. Uh, and I think he's the first rat who has come out publicly and said, I'm a rat. That's exactly what I am. Uh, and this is how it is. And I think that if if a rat has scruples, which I don't think they do. I think in this situation with Frank, he's got a little, he's got, he's got a couple of scruples about him. 
Uh, he's pretty much, for the most part, stayed out of trouble since he got out, with the exception of a couple of things. But he's still a rat at the end of the day. Uh, and I'm not defending him by any stretch of the imagination because that's what people are going to say. Yeah, you're defending him. It's not what I'm doing. I'm just laying out the facts. Uh, the facts are I believe he's pretty much an honest guy for the most part. I think he's honest about what he did, why he did it. Uh, I think there could probably be a little more emphasis put on the fact that he didn't want to go to prison. But I think for somebody to just publicly like say it, you know how many other guys like Frank aren't saying that? They want to blame it on every. Oh, no, this guy testified before me. This guy testified before his sister. You know, and all this crazy stuff. So I, I give it to Frank at least on that respect that he's at least like upfront about who he is and what he did. Half of these other motherfuckers can't do that. They just want to point at everybody. Uh, you know, and, and, and listen, my stance is still I don't respect informants. I don't respect rats. I still think that Frank should have just played it out till he gets arrested and just keep his mouth shut and go do his time, you know, and uh, that's that's what I believe. Frank's not going to agree with me on that. Uh, I haven't talked to Frank in a long time and I don't plan on talking to him, uh, but I'm sure as a result of this, <laughs> the fork, that's what I call him, the fork, the fork is probably going to reach out screaming how I got this wrong, that wrong, and I made him look bad. I don't give a fuck. Uh, I do a show, you're the rat, you do what you do. Uh, so that's pretty much it for Tommy Patera. I know it it, it should have been a more in-depth show than it was, but uh, there's not a ton known, and I didn't want to like cheat sheet it off of fucking Philip Carlo's book because I you can't substantiate half of it. And that's the thing. If, if I start regurgitating unsubstantiated claims, then I'm not being honest. Uh, I wish I knew more. Uh, I, and, and I've been told that Tommy will not do a book until Frank comes out publicly and says he's a fucking rat and lied about everything. Frank's never going to do that, so Tommy's never going to do a book. Uh, nor should he. He's old school. He's old school. A lot of these guys are old school. You don't write books. You don't even talk to the media. You know, that's the way it used to be. And, and listen, I appreciate all the people that do talk to me that shouldn't. But I'm also very protective of them, and I'm very care careful and cautious about how I deal with them, you know. And so that's Tommy Patera. Now, here's what we got in store for next week. We're going to do another Q&A, uh, and we're, we're going to do, obviously, another topic. Uh, in the meantime, uh, if you guys have any questions, you can shoot them over to me on Twitter at RealMobTalk7. Follow me on Twitter. Uh, follow the True Crime page, Scott Williams Collier. Uh, check us out on Facebook at Mob Talk Radio. Check us out on Instagram at Mob Talk Radio. We... Excuse me, we are going to be doing some giveaways here probably in the next two weeks. Uh, I'm just trying to get a couple of things set up. Uh, we are going to be doing Mob Talk merch as, as well as some other merch, I think, that's going to be uh, entertaining for people. Uh, we're going to do a whole entire, I think, don't hold me to this, I think we're going to do a whole entire uh, boss, godfather type of line of shirts. Uh, and I'm, I'm looking into that now, but it's just like, it's like one of these things. I'm trying to keep the cost low because I, you know, I don't want people paying $40 a shirt. That's ridiculous. So, uh, we're going to look at that and, and see what we can do. And, uh, you know, some of the guys will be like Joey Merlino, uh, John Gotti, uh, Albert Anastasia, Carlo Gambino, Vito Genovese, Vinny the Chin Gigante, just, you know, sort of figures in that life. Now I'm sure I'm going to get a call that people are going to want to fucking kick back now. <laughs> how much you selling a shirt for there, cuz? Cuzzo, how many shirts you sell? Kujin, how many did you, you sell this week? What's my kickback? I'm sure that's that's going to happen. Hey, Bo, you owe me money for that fucking shirt. That, that's, that's, that's probably what I'm going to get. But we'll deal with that when it happens. So thanks for listening in. Do us a favor. Just like the show. If you don't like the show, you don't have to like the show. Uh, just share it. Uh, that's all we ever ask. Just share it. Share it to one person. Share it in a group page. Just share. Uh, that's how the show gets bigger. That's how we're able to do more things. And as we move forward, uh, come October, we're going to have some really, really cool guests on. People you would not expect are going to be on Mob Talk Radio. But I can't really get into who that's going to totally be at this point because I sort of want that to be a surprise. And I don't want to speak before everything sort of like signed off and, and good to go. Uh, we're also going to do some documentary stuff. Uh, I know I said earlier I wasn't going to go to the Joey Merlino sentencing, but I think I am at this point. 
Uh, and the reason why I am going is because uh, I want to have a little talk with somebody. And so uh, we'll see if Mr. Cameraman, Mr. Big Mouth, uh, wants to talk to me in person. So that's probably not going to go well for me. Somebody's going to have to get the bail money ready. Ratweiser's going to call the cops. <laughs> I just don't like the guy. What do you want me to do? All right, anyway, thanks for listening, and we'll see everybody next week.